So here I want to go through some stuff in 3D. I want to take stuff that we've drawn like this in a Lewis structure, and I want to go through an organic, and I want to make this into a 3D image. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to show you how to do that, and I'm going to use some model kits to kind of show you a little bit and get some chemicals out, and then we're going to look at SN1 and SN2 reactions at the end. Now, this is a 2D flat image. If I were to actually build this, it would be a tetrahedral shape. And so I'm not really representing what this looks like in, in real life because, because I had to work it into the constraints of, of two dimensions. So here's a model kit that would be similar to this. So what I have here is I have a carbon atom in the center and I have four different atoms attached. An orange, a yellow, a green, and kind of a purple. And that's my tetrahedral shape. So, so this is a little bit better what we look like. Obviously we're not going to have springs and our atoms are not going to be colorful. But, but we're getting more of a 3D representation that's a little more accurate of what this will actually be like in real life. And something interesting happens when I have a carbon atom with four different things attached. Okay, and what, so let's start by looking at how would I draw this? How can I draw this better than I've drawn it up here? Okay, so what I wanna do is I wanna add some three-dimensional uh, construction to this. So I'm going to take the same picture here, but I want to draw it in 3D, and how I'm going to do that is, is really simply, I'm going to take my carbon, I'm going to keep my hydrogen there, I'm going to draw my fluorine there. So now my bond is a little bit bigger than 90 degrees, it's 109.5 is the aim, I'm sure it's not exactly perfect, but you get the idea that we're trying to get a better representation. So if we, if we look at this like this, we can see that this actually slopes down a little bit below 90 degrees. Okay, so we've drawn the yellow and the purple there, but how do I draw the orange and the green? So we have a way to do that. What we do is we draw a dashed line that looks like this, and a little triangular wedge that's colored in like this. The dashed line means it's behind the board. Okay, so if we were to look at it from this angle again, and we were to get it, so if we have our hydrogen atom is the yellow, our fluorine is this purple. I have an orange one that's out here closer to the camera, and I have a green one that's back here closer to the wall. The green one is going to be the chlorine. Okay, it's the one that's behind. So this means that it's behind the, this is being drawn uh, kind of in the concrete wall that's behind the board. And then this one, here we're going to put our bromine, and that would be the orange one that's out in front. So when I draw this, I'm actually trying to give you a visualization that, that the bromine atom is out of the plane and the chlorine atom is behind the plane. Now, this is how you will typically see a tetrahedral atom drawn. You'll see two that are within the plane and then one that's behind and one that's in front. You don't need to do that. There are several ways I can rotate this where that's not necessary, although a lot of them will have two in the plane if you want to simplify it down. Of course, we could reverse it and draw it something like this and all kinds of things like that. Just for another example, we could of course draw it like this. Here I've got the orange and the purple out in front, the green and the yellow are behind. So if I were to draw that, okay, I'm not sure exactly, let's see. I had yellow as my hydrogen, purple as my fluorine. So let's start with those. So let's do it like this with the yellow and purple behind. So behind is gonna have a dashed line. So I have my hydrogen there fluorine there. Okay, and then I have my other two that are going to be outside the plane. So if we look really quickly here, the green is the chlorine. So the chlorine is over on this side. And that leaves us with the bromine on this side. So this is the same molecule. It's just been rotated in space. It's the same 3D drawing. It's just you know, kind of twisting it. But these are two ways you could represent this. I, I would say that this is a little easier to deal with and a little easier to visualize than say this one because we're leaving out, you know, we're adding in a lot of dimension to where we don't, where we're limited in drawing that. So, so obviously I think that this is a little simpler to interpret, but these are the same thing. Now you'll notice that I'm struggling through trying to keep track of which one is which, and there's a reason for that. And that is because in three dimensions, there are two different versions of this molecule that had this Lewis structure. So having these four things attached to the carbon actually creates two different molecules 
but they're, but they're connected the same, and so these are not structural isomers. So structural isomers, you've seen before, this is when you have, you know, two methyl propane instead of butane. We have all the same parts, but you've connected them differently. Structural isomers. These are not. So these are geometric isomers. These are stereoisomers. And that kind of implies that what we're dealing with here is something that's not really based on which atoms are connected to which, but how they're connected in three dimensions or in space that's different. Uh, whereas in the other one, we would have to take apart several things and put them back together differently. In this one, it's more about being able to swap things that are bonded um, in space, and that's going to create two different molecules. Now, this is a very difficult subject. It's, it's, uh, when you get to organic chemistry in college, this is going to be a tough thing for you to sit down and kind of be able to stare at a piece of paper until, until this makes sense. Uh, so we're going to go through that a little bit here. But, I have some model kits over here. So let's take a look at these. So these are two of the, of the versions that I've drawn up here. You've got your two purple, two green, two yellow, and your two orange. And looking at them, of course, they look very similar. And you would think that they might be the same, but they are not the same. These are two different molecules. And these are actually mirror images of each other. So if you think about me placing a mirror here, that would, of course, make sense. The yellow mirrors the yellow, the green mirrors the green, and so on and so forth. But if I pick this up and I actually try and bring this over here, and put this on top of it, you'll see that it's impossible for me to make the same thing. If I put the purples and oranges together, then the green and the yellows are switched. If I try and rotate that, where I put the yellow and greens together, now the orange and the purples are switched. And no matter what I do, if I put green and purple together, then the yellows and oranges are switched. So these are not possible for me to take and to put on top of each other. They are two different molecules. Even though they have the same four things attached. In three-dimensional space, they're different. And so these are stereoisomers. And specifically, these are mirror images of each other. And we have a, we have a name for that, and it's called enantiomers. Okay, so if we come back over here. So enantiomer. means just that, it means mirror image. Uh, and the common example given is, is if you have two hands, which you probably do, they look very similar. I was wearing a ring on one, maybe my fingernails are different, or some other little differences, but, but if we look at the overall structure, they are mirror images of each other. But if you try and take your hands and put them on top of each other, you'll realize that they're not the same, they're different. They're related, they're very similar, but they're different in three-dimensional space, and that's what a Nancy mirror is. Okay. Now in organic chemistry, we actually have a way of, of the going through and saying, well, which of the two enantiomers do you have? And we have a scheme to, to name these using the letter R or the letter S that we're not going to look at in this particular class. Um, another thing that we should talk about is that when you have these carbons with four different things attached, that they're going to be what's called chiral. Okay, And, and, and chiral uh, has a property of it where when light interacts with this molecule, with this carbon center, with the four different things attached, it's going to cause a change to the electric field in that light, and that's going to cause the light to come out a little differently than it went in. Uh, and specifically, it's, it's a circular polarization of the light, and, and there are molecules then that have these, these carbons with four separate things attached that can then change light, and we can measure that really easily. And so it allows us to look at molecules that have these carbons with four separate things attached in a very simple manner. We can go through and analyze them really easily because of how they interact with light. So if you want to make something chiral, I'm sorry, if you want, if you want to make enantiomers, all you would do is take the same molecule with four things attached to a carbon. If you change the place of two of them, you'll end up with the enantiomer. Okay? So, so to make this, all I had to do was, was I had to, you know, put the yellow and green in, but then put the orange and purple in separate spots. If I take one of them and I break them apart and switch their places, then I'll end up with the enantiomer, which is the same thing as the first molecule that I built that I haven't taken apart. So now we can see that when I put this on top of each other, 
that I get the yellows together, the greens together, purples together, and the oranges together. So, so by switching the place of two, I change it back to the other form. If I switch any two again, then I'll go back and now I'll have enantiomers again. So I'll have two different molecules. Okay, so now if I go ahead and look, and if I put my yellow and green together, like that, my purple and orange are now, and orange and purple are now switched. If I put my green and purple together, then my yellow and orange are now reversed. So, so by switching the places of the bromine and the chlorine, I'm actually changing the molecule. Now if I did the places of the bromine and the chlorine and the fluorine and the hydrogen, then it would still be the same thing. Okay. So you can see where this can get tricky to try and keep up with that pace of, of, in your head, looking at this in 3D on a piece of paper and having to make sense of that. Now, sugars oftentimes will have a carbon where the, it has four different things attached to it. So you'll get this chiral carbon center. So corn syrup here um, has that property. And if we take corn syrup then and we put polarizing filter in front, uh, you'll be able to see really clearly that as I rotate this, that, that the light is being affected by that corn syrup. Okay. Whereas if I just take this, you know, polarizing filters will block out light and let it through, um, but the corn syrup is, is circularly polarizing that light, and that's causing different colors to come out at different points of polarization. Okay. And so this is an example of something that has chiral carbon centers in it, and, and so therefore it's able to, to interact with light. Now, most things that have these actually will not, will not change light to us because uh, they will end up being racemic mixtures, is what it's called. And racemic would mean that you have equal amounts of both enantiomers. So usually if I synthesize a chemical that has a chiral carbon center in it, I'm going to get equal amounts of both of those, of those stereoisomers, both of those enantiomers. And one is going to cause an effect on light one way, and the other one is going to cause an effect on light the other way. And, and the net effect of that then is, is that the light will come out the same. Okay, and corn syrup is, is unique in that it's not both of those in equal amounts, that there's, there's a net of one. And so we do see that net effect. Now, the ability of this to kind of translate through to light allows us to track reactions in a really kind of convenient way. By the way, if you want to see a really nice corn syrup demonstration, I have one where I actually do this in the dark and get some really nice uh, color schemes, and I do it with scattering as well. Uh, so if you, look in the, if you look in the link in the description, you can, you can go to that video. Um, but let's look at SN1 now and SN2 reactions and how this might come into play. So, let's not actually put chemicals in here, let's just put numbers in here. So let's say I have a carbon that has one thing attached, a second thing attached, a third thing attached, and a fourth thing attached. And let's assume that four is going to be our leaving group, and that five is going to be our nucleophile. So we're going to do a substitution reaction, and the 5 is going to come in and knock out the 4. There are two ways for that to happen, but now that we can see things in 3D a little bit, you'll see how it's really easy to kind of track how much of each one occurs. So if we're having an SN1 reaction occur, then the first step of an SN1 reaction is, is you're going to form the carbocation. So this 4 then is going to leave, taking those electrons with them, and you're going to form that positively charged ion in the carbon. You'll still have 1 attached, you'll still have 2 attached, and you'll still have 3. Now as this leaves, the electrons in, in that bonding sites are going to push this to here, like that. So that's what your carbocation is going to look like, and then of course you'll have 4 up here, and they have charge. So, so, now if you think about that, you have a kind of flat triangle shape. If you have 5 come along, and it has a pair of electrons, and they get charged, it can come from behind the carbon, or it can come from in front of the carbon. 
Both of those are viable options. So what's going to happen is, is sometimes it's going to hit the carbon on one side from above the plane, and that's going to push one, two, and three down. And then sometimes it's going to come from behind the carbon from our perspective, and that's going to push one, two, and three out. And what that's going to do is that's going to create both enantiomers. So you're going to have one and two. And if, and if we have this five come hit from this side, that's going to leave the five with a wedge in front of the board, and that's going to push the three back behind. But if we have the five come from the other end, now the five will end up behind, and the three will end up in front. And there really isn't any distinction between those two. It's a very symmetrical situation. So, so if an SN1 reaction occurs, we would end up with a racemic mixture. We would end up with both enantiomers present in equal amounts. So if we ran light on that, we wouldn't see any, any polarization of the light. Now, if we go ahead and try that with SN2, it's different. So in SN2, starting with the same molecule, Now the 5 is going to come in before the 4 leaves, and they're going to have a, a kind of a make and break at the same time. So here we have 5, okay, here's our nucleophile, it has to come from this side. It's not going to come in from here where the 4 is and be able to dislodge that. So, so the 5 is going to come in from the other side as the 4 leaves. And so what that means is that now the 5 is coming from behind the molecule, assuming the 4 was in front, and that's going to cause the 3 to get pushed to where the 4 was. So I'm going to draw this over here because I've kind of gotten crazy with my arrows. But now I'm going to have the 3 here, the 5 behind, and the 1 and the 2 right there. So what's happened there is as long as 5 and 4 are similar, um, in terms of atomic number, I've just inverted my stereo center, I've inverted my, my chiral carbon there, and now I have the different form of it. And so, and I'm not going to end up with, with the other enantiomer, I'm just going to end up with this. So, really simply, I can go through and I can see how much of an SN1 or SN2 mechanism I'm getting by how much light gets polarized by the product. Okay? So that's a good example of, of looking at an organic reaction in 3D and how that can give us some insight into what's happening in the mechanism. Is, is 5 coming in and, and causing 4 to break? Or is 4 breaking on its own through solvent means or something like that? And then 5 is coming through? Well, we can see really clearly based on the result and just a little bit of light rotation. Okay.